On this Friday night, Donald Trump's search warrant unsealed. There may be fire along with the smoke. New details reveal the scope of the FBI's unprecedented operation, what it could mean for the former U.S. president. They'll decide whether or not there's a basis to charge someone with a crime. Salman Rushdie attacked. The acclaimed author's shocking stabbing on stage. The literary world reacts to the violent assault of a polarizing figure. Plus, press conference derailed. Holy Christ. What was that? Doug Ford's buzzworthy moment on national TV. I just swallowed the beef. Oh my God. Global National with Farah Nasser. Good evening and thank you for joining us. Tonight we're learning more about what was in the 11 sets of highly classified documents taken from former U.S. President Donald Trump's Florida home. On Monday, FBI agents descended on Trump's Mar-a-Lago mansion with a search warrant, specifically looking for government materials Trump allegedly took from the White House when he left office. And what investigators found suggests Trump is under investigation for potentially serious violations of U.S. law. Let's get right to our Washington Bureau Chief Jackson Prosco. Jackson, what was in those boxes? Well, Farah, we don't have a lot of specifics at this point, just a general idea that there was a lot of classified information, and it all suggests there's a serious probe underway into the former president and his conduct. The search warrant shows the FBI recovered 11 sets of classified documents from Donald Trump's home, some categorized as top secret, among the most sensitive and valuable U.S. intelligence, meant to only be viewed in secure government facilities. Another item was labeled info regarding the president of France, along with pictures and boxes of documents. A report from the Washington Post goes further, suggesting the FBI's primary target was documents related to nuclear weapons. What we'll see happen over the next few days is DOJ will first review the evidence that they seized from Mar-a-Lago. They'll decide whether or not there's a basis uh, based on what they found to charge someone with a crime. The unsealed search warrant also reveals serious legal jeopardy for Trump. The Department of Justice is investigating violations of three U.S. laws, including the Espionage Act, for gathering or transmitting defense information and potential obstruction of justice for destruction, alteration, or falsification of records in a federal investigation. The search warrant was authorized by a federal court upon the required finding of probable cause. In a post on his Truth Social platform, Trump called the nuclear weapons issue a hoax and without evidence accused the FBI of planting information. Later, he claimed all the documents were declassified. The FBI raid of President Trump is a complete abuse and overreach of its authority. Republicans continue to stand by their man, suggesting Trump is the victim of an overzealous and political FBI. Notably, some are now making room for the possibility of serious misconduct by the former president, demanding more information before rendering judgment. Was it nuclear? Was it, uh, heck, maybe it was aliens. That's the point. We don't know. We're asking them to tell us. Specifics aren't contained in the documents unsealed Friday, and the underlying affidavit remains sealed, likely to protect the ongoing investigation and any confidential sources who may be working with the Justice Department. Still unknown, the former president's underlying motivation for leaving office with boxes of government material. These are some very serious uh, allegations, espionage, obstruction, destruction. Now, Jackson, Trump and his allies are arguing that the materials were declassified. Is there any proof of those claims? Well, we don't know that for a fact. There would certainly be a paper trail if that process had been undertaken. But I think the bigger picture thing here to keep in mind is that those highest levels of classification cannot be unilaterally declassified by a president. Often there is an agency review process. It's a multi-step process and there are multiple parties involved. So Trump himself may have not been able to declassify things related, for example, to nuclear weapons, if that is, in fact, uh, in the documents that were uh, recovered from Mar-a-Lago. All right, I know we'll be getting more details in the coming days. Jackson Prosco in Washington, thank you. Acclaimed and polarizing author Salman Rushdie was stabbed in the neck today while he was on stage at a convention in western New York. The governor of New York says the 75-year-old is alive and he's getting the care he needs. 
and the suspect is in custody. Rushdie has faced death threats in the past. He spent years with a bounty on his head, hiding from Iran because of his writing. Tonight, Eric Sorensen looks at that and this latest attack. It was a scene of chaos in the normally tranquil setting of New York State's Chautauqua Institution. Salman Rushdie, about to speak, was attacked by a man who jumped on stage, says this witness. Repeated fist strokes into his chest and neck. Uh, apparently he had a knife. i just devastated at seeing this happen to someone I respect. The attacker was subdued and is in custody. Several members of the staff at the institution and audience members rushed the suspect and took him to the ground. The suspect has been identified as Haiti Matar, age 24, from Fairview, New Jersey. Rushdie was flown by helicopter to a nearby hospital where he was in surgery late Friday afternoon. Here's an individual who has uh, spent decades uh, speaking truth to power, someone who's been out there um, unafraid, despite the threats. A renowned novelist, Rushdie was forced into hiding more than 30 years ago after writing the book, The Satanic Verses. It had provocative themes about the Prophet Muhammad that many Muslims considered blasphemous. Rushdie's effigy and his books were burned. Iran's supreme leader, Ayatollah Khomeini, issued a fatwa calling for Rushdie's death. For years, the author appeared in public only with heavy security. He later spoke of the need to stay in the public eye. It's clear that you have to defend things you don't agree with. Otherwise, what is free speech if it's only for people that you sort of agree with? In 1992, Bob Ray was Ontario's premier, one of the first political leaders in the world to publicly embrace Rushdie, who was grateful. Canadian writer Margaret Atwood, like Rushdie, has been an outspoken advocate for free speech in literature, calling Rushdie courageous. We're all extremely sorry that something like this has happened, but it is a wake-up call to us that if we really want to live in a democracy, we need to defend freedom of expression and we need to do it vigilantly. So I take the subway, you know. Over time, the prolific writer has lived with much less security and put aside the fear of death threats. What helped me come out of that was beginning to fight back. And I think, you know, when you're fighting back, you don't, you don't feel like a package in the corner waiting for somebody to come and get you. But in Iran, a $3 million bounty reportedly remained on Rushdie, some believing the Ayatollah's original verdict was irrevocable. At Chautauqua, Rushdie was just about to speak about freedom of expression and America as a safe haven for artists in exile. Eric Sorensen, Global News, Toronto. In Montenegro, 12 people are dead following a mass shooting in the country's western region. Six others were injured, including a police officer. Witnesses say a local man opened fire, shooting people at random, reportedly following a family dispute. The 34-year-old gunman was eventually shot dead by police. When Russia invaded Ukraine in late February, it also launched a parallel propaganda war to try to blur the lines about what was happening on the ground in Ukraine in an effort to divide the world of the truth. Tonight, our Jeff Sample looks into Russia's notorious troll factory that is flooding social media with lies and is also taking aim at Canadians. This Canadian veteran recently returned home to Quebec after narrowly escaping Ukraine with his life. He was fighting in the Donbass back in April when his volunteer unit was ambushed by a Russian tank. There was this huge explosion and I saw the shrapnels flying in front of me. The Canadian sniper, known as Wally, spent two months in the battlefield, where he also got caught in a propaganda war. The Russians are not sophisticated fighters. After providing interviews to Western journalists back in March, Wally's story went viral. Russia responded, first with posts suggesting he'd been killed. Then state media wrote that Wally had condemned Ukraine's military as a terrible disappointment, full of chaos, looting and incompetence. They pretty much took a few words I did and deformed it just enough so it kind of makes sense. So it sounds like I'm terribly disappointed, which I'm not. What he actually said to a French newspaper was that war itself is a disappointment particularly for inexperienced Western volunteers who initially rushed to Ukraine looking for adventure. Wally says the Ukrainian soldiers he met on the front line were anything but disappointing. I really do think they are the most courageous soldier I ever saw, personally. But those twisted facts and misquotes were heavily promoted online by a small army of professional internet trolls like Senya Klochkova. 
At the start of the war, the Russian journalist went undercover inside a Russian troll factory, a new operation called Cyberfront Z. When I was hired, they told me this is a temporary enterprise to support Russia's army in cyberspace, Klochkova told Global News. She says they used fake accounts, often with Western names, to post comments on YouTube and across social media praising Putin and condemning those who oppose the war. She says the people in charge are linked to this former, now notorious, troll factory in St. Petersburg, which was accused of meddling in the 2016 U.S. presidential election. The operation employed 100 people per shift, she says. They were paid $1,000 a month and were required to publish at least 200 comments every day. Those comments, pushing the Kremlin's narrative that Russia is liberating Ukraine from Nazis, were then reinforced by Russian state media. It's impossible to defeat Russia. Yevgeny Popov is one of Russia's most popular TV hosts. He claims, for example, that atrocities committed by Russian forces against Ukrainian civilians in Bucha were fake. Russia have no connections to those dead bodies. When asked for evidence, he falsely claimed that it took Ukraine five days to reveal civilians had been massacred and that the victims were never identified. Give us a name. Give us a name. Give us a family. Global News and other world media outlets have identified many names of civilians killed in Bucha. But a quick, simple online search also turns up articles referencing those Russian conspiracies, a testament to how effectively the Kremlin has flooded the internet with disinformation, burying the truth no matter the cost. Jeff Semple, Global News. It's too early to say that monkeypox cases are plateauing, but health officials are encouraged by what may be the beginning of a positive trend. There's some early signs of a slowing down of that um, accelerated uh, epi curve. So we're not, uh, the, the cases are not increasing at the speeds at which they were increasing at the beginning of the outbreak. Dr. Tam adds they still need to collect a few more weeks of data to determine if cases are plateauing. Meanwhile, Canada broke the 1,000 confirmed cases of monkeypox threshold this week, which has officials urging continued vigilance. The vast majority of cases involve men who have sex with men, but Tam stresses anyone can contract or transmit monkeypox. Approximately 50,000 of the nearly 100,000 distributed doses of the monkeypox vaccine have been administered so far. Navigating Canada's changing housing market. Coming up with some markets cooling, experts weigh in on which mortgage options may be best for you. The housing market looks a lot different today than it did during the buying frenzy throughout the height of the pandemic. Home prices and activity have cooled and many economists think that there is more correction to come. And Gaviola has more on the changing variables and how to navigate this challenging market. Canada's housing market has defied expectations throughout the pandemic, with an eye-popping run-up in prices, which only began to cool as the central bank jacked up interest rates starting in March. This the last two years have shown us anything, and is that you know predictions can be wrong most of the time. Nick Hill is a real estate investor with money in a handful of projects in Ontario. For some, he went with a static variable rate mortgage, which means monthly payments don't change when the Bank of Canada increases its benchmark lending rate. What changes is the ratio of interest versus principal he's paying, with more going towards interest. What's really started to happen is the cash flow on these properties has started to dissipate. Um, and. I'm looking at that not happy. However, I'm looking at that as a temporary thing. Variable rates has, have historically always performed better than fixed rates over a long period of time. His investment horizon is long term though, so he's not losing sleep over it. With a myriad of changing considerations, making the right choice for you can be a challenge. Daniel Foch, who does a real estate podcast with Hill, suggests buyers do their own stress test, including a worst case financial scenario to fully understand their financial cushion and risk tolerance. Examine the total cost of the interest that you'd pay over the course of a mortgage term and look at that side by side with the you know, three different interest rates or mortgage products that you might be looking at. 
During the pandemic, the popularity of variable rate mortgages soared, but they may not be the right fit, especially for households with little financial flexibility. I think that this is a symptom of a housing market that is basically in crisis and people were chasing prices. Personal finance expert Rubina Ahmed Haq suggests preparing for another hefty interest rate hike expected in September. So that's a really scary position to be in, whether you're a seller or a buyer, because it does just create that unpredictability. With so much up in the air, it's never been more important for prospective buyers and sellers to do their homework before making a move. Anne Gaviola, Global News, Toronto. Rogers and Shaw have finalized an agreement to sell Freedom Mobile, paving the way for a merger of Canada's biggest telecom companies. Rogers will sell the Shaw-owned wireless carrier to Videotron, which is owned by Quebecor, for $2.85 billion. The telecom giant hopes the deal will appease federal regulator concerns about its proposed takeover of Shaw. Rogers and Shaw claim the combination of Freedom and Videotron will create a strong fourth national carrier. The agreement is subject to regulatory approvals and the closing of the Rogers-Shaw merger. And if you're a TELUS customer, you could soon see a new fee on your bill. The telecom giant has applied to the CRTC to add a 1.5% surcharge starting this fall. The fee would only apply to customers paying with a credit card outside of Quebec. TELUS says the average increase would be around $2 a month, and customers can avoid the fee by paying via debit or through a bank. Ahead, another round of flash floods tear through Las Vegas. Now that's not a royal flush. That's what looks like a waterfall pouring through a casino rooftop in Las Vegas after heavy rain triggered flash flooding that completely swamped the desert city's famous strip. The scene is a flashback to just a few weeks ago when another severe thunderstorm rolled through. From heavy flooding to fierce fires, crews from across Europe are being rushed to France to help tame towering flames tearing through the country's pine forests. A monstrous wildfire south of Bordeaux that destroyed swaths of land in July erupted again this week, with another heat wave scorching the region and elsewhere, including Spain and the UK. Since the beginning of the year, nearly 60,000 hectares of forest has been wiped out in France. The wildfires have produced nearly a million metric tons of carbon from June to August, which is almost equal to the annual carbon dioxide emissions from 790,000 cars. Actor Anne Heche has died from injuries she sustained in a fiery car crash last week. Heche was declared legally dead today. Her body is still on life support for organ donation. The 53-year-old was critically injured after crashing her car into a house in Los Angeles on August 5th. Police say an initial blood sample reveals the presence of drugs in her system. Heche rose to fame in the early 1990s on television and films like Six Days, Seven Nights and Donnie Brasco. She had a high-profile relationship with Ellen DeGeneres generous shortly after the comedian came out as gay. The mother of two was open about her lifelong struggles with her mental health. Heche continued to have an active film and TV career. Not coming from the uh, government per se, but the premier, it's coming from the health sector. <laughs> Holy Christ. What was that? I just swallowed a bee. Oh, my God. Holy Christ. I knew that little bugger. Oh. Are you okay? I'm good. He's down here buzzing around right now. He has a lot of, he has a lot of real estate. Now, if that was in the clip, okay, this is going to be replayed over and over again. And that just made Colin DeMello's day. He's going to be laughing all the way back to the sea. Oh, I'm sure he was. And he joins us now. Colin DeMello is Global's Queen's Park Bureau Chief at the Ontario Legislature. Colin, great to see you. Uh, you know, he's used to stinging criticism, Doug Ford, but this was something else. Oh, Farah, this was a surreal moment. And what was supposed to be a very serious news conference about the health care system in Ontario, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, the premier started gagging and choking, trying to dig a bee out of his mouth. Never in political history I think, have we ever seen in this country a premier ingesting and 
perhaps digesting a bee live on TV during a news conference. The entire uh, uh, crowd that was gathered there, from reporters to his staff, were in stunned silence. We didn't know what to think. Uh, a lot of people started thinking about the premier's uh, well-being and then thinking, what would we do if this happened to us? I think a lot of us were pretty horrified at the idea. And, and I'm sure social media was a buzz with this. Oh, yes, this is a buzzworthy moment for sure. Uh, we were there to talk about the privatization of the health care system. The premier joked, well, maybe he might need to go to the health care system, the hospital, to get that B removed. A lot of people on Twitter firing back saying, hey, when he gets there, maybe the ERs might actually be closed in Ontario. Well, never a dull day in Ontario politics. Colin DeMello, thank you so much. Unbelievable. <laughs> See, this is why masks are a good idea. That is Global National for this Friday night. Thank you so much for spending part of your evening with us. We're going to leave you tonight with a little bit more of Premier Ford because, well, why not? Holy Christ, he's, he's wedged in my throat. Sorry, guys. A little bugger got away in there. If you want to take a second, <laughs> take, take a second. No, I'm, I'm okay. He's buzzing in there. Man, he went right down the hatch. Okay, guys. <laughs> this is a classic, okay? <laughs> this is, holy Christ. Sorry. Oh, this is a good one. I'm going to be howling tonight watching this tape. <laughs> Nitu Gurcha will be back at the Anchor Desk tomorrow. Until Monday, take care of yourselves and each other. Good night.